I can learn to understand you much better if I can get familiar with the way you talk. Whoops. I don't know who, I don't know if that was Alexa or Siri or who that was talking. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm John Rabbits, the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for the Business Council of Westchester. And we want to welcome everyone to our Tompkins Manpack Bank Power Breakfast. Uh, the, today's topic is one that all of us are uh, living and breathing on a daily basis, which is working remotely and keeping your team engaged, productive, and effective. Uh, and so once again, uh, on behalf of Marsha Gordon, our President, CEO, and the entire Business Council of Westchester, we really want to thank uh, Tompkins Mayapak Bank for their ongoing support and partnership. Uh, when the world changed and uh, we decided that we were going to have to shift all our program virtually, uh, Dave D'Amelia and his team said, absolutely, let's keep these power breakfasts going. Let's continue to have relevant programming. Uh, and I'm sure all of you will be very uh, happy with the program that we have today. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dave D'Amelia, who is the Senior Vice President of Tompkins Mayapak Bank. Dave? Thank you, John, and, and thank you to Amanda and Marsha and the entire uh, business council. Um, John, you know, you, you mentioned uh, early on in the pandemic, and we just had full confidence that if anybody was going to be able to shift from doing networking events uh, in person to now virtual, it was the business council that you guys would be able to do it right, and you have, so congratulations. Um, but today's topic is one that I think, you know, obviously we can all relate to. I think we're all very interested in hearing what the panelists have to say, so I will be brief, but there are a couple of things I just wanted to mention. Um, first, I did want to uh, just highlight what Tompkins Mayapac Bank, how we responded to uh, support our local businesses right at the outset of the pandemic. Um, everybody remembers, and I'm sorry to bring this up because uh, we're probably all still having nightmares about it, but how the, uh, you know, the PPP program rolled out and it was very confusing. Uh, the big banks were, were not even getting involved. The community banks were rolling up their sleeves and digging in and trying to figure it out. And uh, there was um, a lot of starts and stops right at the outset, but we were among the first to start taking applications in. And what we found um, very early on is that the, uh, the, the SBA system to upload these applications was not working during the day because everybody was trying to get into the system at the same time. Um, and there was a limited number of, you know, there's a limited dollar amount. So we had to get these things uh, approved for our customers and funded as quickly as possible. So uh, what we did was we set up teams, volunteers, um, and uh, mostly they were millennials. And we've talked, uh, you know, at uh, programs that are at our power breakfast about uh, millennials and some of the things that are important to them. And uh, one of the key things is making a difference. And this was really on display as our team signed up to work through the night to enter these things into the SBA system so they would go through quickly and we could get these uh, these PPP loans funded for our customers and we did 850 of them and it was fantastic. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention was uh, our deferments. Uh, the governor came out earlier in the uh, in the pandemic and you know told all the banks that we had to put our customers on deferment for 90 days, our consumer customers. Well, we had already done it the week before. We got out right at the outset. We said, geez, our customers are closed. They can't make payments. We put all of our customers, not just our consumer customers, but our small businesses on deferment. We reached out to them personally and said, hey, look, why don't you take advantage of this? So that's something that we're very proud of. A uh, couple, just uh, two more quick things. Um, one was, uh, is the thing that how, you know, how have we been dealing with reaching out to our customers right now? And we've been using platforms like this. Uh, we use WebEx. Um, so our video conferencing has been a, a big component of how we've continued to stay in contact with our customers. And that's been really important. And we've used it throughout our, our company. So we've been having our staff meetings 
virtually. Um, we've had our board meetings. Kevin Plunkett is on our board. He's, I believe, in the audience today and the virtual audience. And uh, I think he can attest to the fact that that's all worked really well. So I'd encourage everybody to continue to use these types of platforms to stay connected with your employees. And then finally, um, I wanted to just highlight something that's important, uh, I think, to me and, 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 uh, and hopefully to everybody, is that we have employees that are working both remotely and we have employees that are working in the office. And this has gone on for so long, and both sides uh, can feel isolated. So I think the, um, as important as it, is, as it is to engage our employees to feel, uh, to be productive, we also have to remember those that are back in the office, remember those that are home, and think about how uh, you know it feels in that isolation to be uh, to be working without your coworkers for such a long period of time, regardless of whether you're remote or in the office. So uh, you know we're thinking about things such as uh, you know um, taking breaks during the day and you know continued video conferencing and all sorts of different uh, uh, strategies to deal with stress and coping mechanisms and things like that. So it's just important to remember those on both sides of the equation and do what you can to keep uh, keep them mentally fit as well as uh, physically healthy. So uh, thank you, John, and thank you to the Business Council. And I appreciate it. Sorry that I went on for so long, but uh, important topic. Not at all, Dave. And again, I, that was just a brief snapshot of the commitment that uh, Tompkins Manpack Bank has for their, for their clients uh, and customers. And so we thank you again for the important role that you play in Westchester County. Uh, we couldn't have had come up with a better moderator uh, for today's program. Uh, Kathy D'Agostino is the owner of Win at Business Coaching. Uh, she's a business coach who works with small and mid-sized companies and is a corporate executive coach. Kathy's the founder of her company, Win at Business Coaching, and she works with companies to help them develop their leadership teams, use their core values as a basis for increasing employee engagement and creating a strong culture and improving profitability. Prior to establishing her business, Win at, uh, Kathy, uh, for 20 years held a senior level positions in organizations where she was responsible for turning around underperforming sales teams. And uh, it would be uh, remiss of me if I also didn't say her commitment to the Business Council of Westchester uh, as one of our ambassadors is so important to us. So Kathy, I'm going to turn the program over to you, have you introduce our panelists and look forward to hearing from all of them. Thank you, John, and thank you, Dave, um, for all of those really words of wisdom that we're going to, um, words of wisdom about the employee engagement, about what's so important about your employees, and that's what we're here for today. Um, and thank you to Mayo Peck, um, Tompkins Mayo Peck Bank for sponsoring the event today. Also want to, as we start off, thank the attendees for all showing up. I know you've got, you know, everybody's busy today, has lots of things on their plate. But I think it's such an important topic and there's a lot of people, I think we had over 115 people registered. So that speaks a lot to the importance of this topic and thank all of you for showing up. And I wanna thank our amazing panelists for being here today and taking their time. So as we get started, uh, I just wanna give a little bit of a, kind of build on what Dave said and um, elaborate a little bit more. Over the past year, workplaces have faced powerful and unforeseen factors. None of us could have foreseen this in January. Um, global pandemic, economic uncertainty, cultural reckoning, and so much more. Organizations have had to balance ongoing operations with these unique challenges, while industries continue to evolve at a dizzying pace. Throughout, and perhaps because of it, all this, um, employee engagement has become a top priority for leaders. It was always important, but today is just really, really um, bubbled up to the top. And so how has this past year impacted employees at all levels, our senior levels, our you know, other leaders and our regular, our, all of our employees? Um, we know that we were on site for the most part in our work, physical workplaces. We went remote, as Dave mentioned, and then now we have this hybrid model and we like to, um, it's been referred to lately as the scattered employee. So I think that speaks well to what the situation looks like um, from everybody's perspective. But most importantly, we want to talk about today is how leaders can better understand and effectively engage with their teams about moving forward. With those questions in mind, we've assembled a panel of business owners and leaders who will share with us today their experiences and what they've learned and will help us all move forward. 
they want to shed some light on what the workplace, the new workplace really looks like and their businesses and some of their clients they can share. And also some of the difficult challenges that are affecting our employees. None of this is very easy and we've all been navigating it, but it definitely offers challenges. Um, and we need, to under we need to discover and understand the factors that we need to deal with. And that's why we're here today. So with that said, I want like to introduce our panelists. We have four of them with us here today. Our first panelist is Carmen Bauman, principal broker of Greengrass Real Estate Corporation. She's an attorney as well as the owner of Greengrass Real Estate Corporation. These are some pretty busy times for real estate here in the local market, um, for sure, as we've all seen that and read the statistics on that. Carmen understands the nuances and potential of real estate issues as related to the underlying transactions. And this allows for her to have smoother closings and provides her clients with a trusted and experienced advisor. Carmen has built a remarkable track record of delivering great results. She's also on the Hagar Board of Directors. Thank you, Carmen, for being here with us. Thanks for having me. Next up is Jeanette Gisberg, the new Executive Director of Volunteer New York. Jeanette joined Volunteer New York way back in 2010 and just recently became the Executive Director in July 2020. She transitioned into this role during the height of the pandemic. What an exciting opportunity to take on this role. Congrats, Jeanette. Um, she did this at, in her previous role. Well, I, let me just also mention, she served as executive fellow for Capacity Building Points of Light, a global network with a 10 month fellowship and then returned to uh, Volunteer New York. In her previous role, she was a deputy executive director at Volunteer New York. She, a couple of things she did there, if it's not impressive enough already, developed and evaluated overall organizational programs and priorities. She also oversaw all the volunteer outreach efforts. One of those is the RSVP program, whose members are all 55 and over, and they give their time and share their expertise to solve many of today's community concerns, so valuable, especially with what's going on. RSVP Westchester alone has over 900 volunteers. I think that's amazing. And just a little special note that this week, Volunteer New York celebrated their 70th anniversary quite an accomplishment. And I want to say I'm so always so proud to be able to attend this beautiful celebration and honor Lisa Keaston as, as the former executive director. Many of you know her as well. Thank you, Jeanette. Our third panelist is Christina Ray, President of Buzz Creators, Inc. For, with more than two decades of experience in marketing and communications, Christina is a seasoned and well-respected advisor to her clients. Her expertise includes public relations, reputation management, brand building, thought leadership, and audience engagement. Prior to founding Buzz Creators, Christina held senior level positions at Citigroup and MasterCard. I'm sure many of you have seen her great work for her clients. And our fourth panelist is Russell Yankwit, founder and partner of Yankwit LLP here in White Plains. Yankwit LLP is an elite trial and litigation firm who boasts the largest litigation team in Westchester and represents businesses and high net worth individuals in litigation across a broad range of complex matters, as well as serve as trial counsel for the national and local firms on their high stake litigations. Recently, Russell's firm has received a number of prestigious awards and recognition. I'll just mention a few of them. I wouldn't have time to do them all, would be, would be here for a long time. So best lawyers in American commercial litigation, New York Metro Super Lawyers, Top 100 Lawyers in New York, Top 25 Lawyers in Westchester County, West Fair Communication C-Suite. Um, well, that's impressive, and there's even more. But thank you, Russell. Thank you all of you. Thank to all of you for being here. I know you're all excited to get started and share your experiences, and we want to hear from you as well. So <clears throat> I also want to invite our audience and we want to make this engaging, productive, and uh, very informative. And we're here for you, obviously. So would love to have you. We're going to use the chat box today. So if you can kind of keep your questions in chat box, it'll make it a little easier for me to be able to navigate that and our panelists to be able to answer more questions. So go ahead. Anytime we're talking, um, if you think of something you want to contribute or comment or a question, please put it in chat box. We'll stop periodically and I'll pay attention to those and we'll pass those questions on to our um, panelists here. 
<clears throat> I will also say, so we saved a little bit of time, hopefully, at the end for some Q&A. So let's do this. Let's get started. We've been preparing for ages for this, so we're excited to share it with you. All right. So the very first question I'm going to start our panelists off with is one that's probably very familiar to everybody, and Dave mentioned this at the beginning. I'll ask each of you to answer the question, to keep it brief again for about a moment or a minute or two, and then <clears throat> this way give everybody an opportunity to share and we can all hear your comments. And also allow again, as I said, Q&A from our audience. <clears throat> our first question is, what did your team look like looking back pre-COVID before March 2020, if we could even remember back that far? And what does it look like now? I know that um, each one of you have a little bit of a different business. So I'd love to start with you, Russell, and tell us a little bit about pre-COVID and now what your team looks like. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so work-wise, we're exactly the same because many of us worked at home, worked at night um, at our home computers. So that's the same, but our team has changed dramatically during COVID. Um, we've actually increased our attorneys by about 30% in the last six months. We've hired some phenomenal attorneys from New York City who wanted to get out of New York City, who realized in COVID the importance of having a work-life family balance. And so we've grown our ranks and with some really spectacular attorneys that we've hired in the last six months. It's a little bit disrupting because um, I've met them uh, by Zoom. I haven't met them all in person yet. And they haven't met my whole staff yet. We're still not going to the office. So it's exciting, but it's also disconcerting that at a small firm to have so many changes in six months. For sure. And Christina? So there's about seven of us at Buzz Creators. Um, we worked at home sometimes prior to COVID. So we were already, everything of ours is in the cloud. Thank you, Box, for having a fantastic shared drive that enables us to um, all easily access all of our files. Um, we have a new employee that started last week. So we've been going into the office a little bit more frequently just to get her up to speed and train her. Um, so I would say that we were used to working from home, but it's certainly a lot more. And being that we're a communications company, um, it was certainly a challenge to get used to not being able to see each other on a regular basis. But um, functionality wise, we've been fine since we were already used to working in the cloud. Thank you. And Carmen? Um, there has been a little bit of change, not too much. Um, so the nature of realtors, you know, sort of almost always on the field. So we have four realtors. Um, they hardly ever went into the office before. And actually post-COVID, after the offices reopened, they actually started coming into the office more. Um, I think there's just the hunger for connection, physical connection with people. Um, and of course, all the safety measures are being taken into account. Um, the staff did change. So we have a two part-time staffers and they used to be in the office five days a week and they are no longer. Um, and that was a tough transition for me, I think just mentally um, to understand that FaceTime is not so important. Um, and then, but, but everything's been, been working out. Thank you for sharing that. And, and Jeanette. Sure. So at Volunteer New York, we have 15 uh, team members, mostly full-time. Um, we went from uh, an in-office setup to a remote setup uh, mid-March. And um, for us, it actually has been a quite a bit of a transition. We had the traditional office setup with an on-site server and everybody coming into the office. Um, and so, um, you know, we've made some changes, which I'm happy to talk about, uh, to give people the tools that they need to work remotely. But um, everybody now is working from home. We have some uh, limited and, and controlled access to our office, but we are officially not back to the office. Yeah, so thank you all for sharing. So an interesting statistic, some research shows that 57% of employees, um, at least part-time, have returned to the office or expect to return to the office by December, um, this December 2020. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about those statistics later, but I think it sounds like from what all of you were saying, that it, it's pretty similar to what the research is also showing. And again, different areas might, you know, in, in the country might look a little different, but Sound pretty similar to what all of you are doing. So I'm just gonna look and see in the chat box if we have any questions. Um, okay, so not yet. We're gonna 
we'll check back again. Um, I, again, you know, I think some similarities in all of you, some differences, but to, every, to everybody's point, there's been change for sure. All right, so that takes us over to question, on that point, it's gonna take us over to question number two. Um, what step have each of you taken to keep employees connected or reconnected as you come back into the office and engaged? Um, you're working remote, some are back in the office, some are in this hybrid scattered model. So I wanted to start with you, Jeanette, um, and ask you, you mentioned you had a couple things that um, you, all of you have done. So what have you done to really, as you took over this new role as well, and so you've had some other, definitely some bigger challenges um, to really get your employees, uh, you know, to be able to do this. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. So it is, I mean, I do want to kind of pause and, and put a, a pin in that, in that idea, which is I came back to an organization that I was very familiar with and had been here for you know, many years, um, but uh, back to uh, a team in a new role. And I've not actually been uh, back together with my team since I've returned. So that is kind of um, uh, overarching kind of this entire experience. Um, but at Volunteer New York, we, uh, we were actually due for, a, for us a pretty significant uh, techn technology kind of infrastructure upgrade. Um, and so one of the decisions that I made kind of early on was that we were going to make that investment um, in a way that would allow us to support this remote environment, not knowing how long this would last. And so we shifted from a traditional, you know, desktop server um, format to now uh, everybody, we got everybody new laptops. Um, and to Christina's point, we actually moved everything to the cloud uh, using Office 365. And so, you know, one thing I, I would say to that is I know that typically those transitions require many months of planning. You know, there's a lot of tools that uh, a, a product like Outlook, three, uh, like a Microsoft 365 can offer. Um, and, you know, in the spirit of full transparency, I want to let everybody know that we basically copied and pasted um, all the dot files that were on our server into the cloud um, because we knew that we needed to um, make that change quickly because the, the team had been working so well already. Um, but, um, you know, they, in order to really increase efficiencies and optimize their talents, we needed to give them better tools. And so, um, and so that's, that's one of the things that we did. Uh, it actually took us uh, until about the end of August to, to make the transition. But once we made the decision to do it, uh, we rolled it out in less than six weeks. Well, I have a couple questions from the panelists, but I, from the audience, but I just wanted to get, did some, did any of you other ones have some different things that you might've done with the employees, like recognition programs, you know, concerns about health and wellness? Anybody have a different, Christina? Sure. So we did, um, we're still doing daily 11 a.m. Zoom calls, and it's a fantastic way for the team to fully check in. It helps us prioritize exactly what the team is working on, what our client priorities are. Um, so that kind of gets us going for the day um, and doing it at 11 o'clock at 11 o'clock seems to work really well because it gives people time to go through their projects, go through their emails, um, but yet they still have plenty of time to go through um, the projects that they need to do that day. We're also using Microsoft Teams, which really helps keep everybody connected with the chat functionality on there and just very organized. Um, and then it's the basics, making sure that everybody has a really good working laptop um, printers at home, headsets, um, all of that kind of stuff, and just keeping everything super detailed. Like we have really detailed client project lists that outline everything that we need to do for each client. And I think that's super important to just keep everybody on the same page and as organized as possible and prioritize because you said the word scattered about employees before. And just because we're all physically scattered, we still want to keep everything <laughs> work-wise unscattered. So organization is super important. We want to make sure you're off by eleven o'clock, so <laughs> so you can join your so you can join your own call, right? <laughs> um, anybody else have anything to contribute? Or maybe we'll, let's take a question here. For, oh, go ahead, Russell, and then we'll take uh, the question from the audience. Well, I've heard from a lot of business owners that in some ways they actually feel more connected these days. 
So as a lawyer, we're all so busy. We put our head down, we get our work done. We run out to see our kids' soccer games. We go back to work in the office late at night. Now with COVID, we make a great effort to speak to each other a few times a week. So on Monday mornings, we do a firm check-in, you know, one or two questions about your weekend, some personal win or some work win. <clears throat> on Thursdays, we do lectures where somebody besides me speaks, which is always a refreshing change. <laughs> and they talk about, um, you know, either, either what, you know, the best writer of the firm will talk about writing or somebody who takes depositions will talk about depositions or how somebody else brings in clients. And then we also do um, monthly in-depth check-ins with everybody in the firm where I'll actually walk around the block with uh, my dog. And so I'm not distracted by any work. And I'll spend an hour with everybody in the firm to really discuss what's going on with their cases, with their life, make sure they have the right technology. And in some ways, we're actually more connected because I didn't, frankly, spend the time pre-COVID, which I do now. So interesting point. Um, I, let's, take, let's take a question from the audience. We have two of them. So the first one in the chat box is, do any of you have hourly employees working at home? And if so, do you ha how do you track their actual hours? So this is a real logistical question here. Anybody want to take that? Yeah, I can answer that. So we have our, we have an hourly employees at Volunteer New York. Um, last year, we actually implemented an online um, timekeeping system for primarily for grant reporting purposes. We're a nonprofit organization, um, but that allows um, that has allowed us the framework to um, accurately track you know hourly employees and her you know their supervisors are responsible for. Uh, keeping an eye on that and making sure that it's kind of within, um, you know, kind of within the the window that is is appropriate. Um, so again, it speaks to your technology, right, that you've put yeah. in and, and some other upgrades. Okay, I just want to move on to this last question. Thanks, Jeanette. So how do you deal with your potential new or existing clients when they are insistent upon having an in-person meeting? And I've heard that before. So Carmen, is that one that you could answer for us? So, sure. I mean, most of our meetings are in person, sort of a requirement of showing a property or visiting a property that just has to happen. Um, I haven't had many clients. I have actually had one client insist on an in office meeting, which was which was fine. We just took the appropriate measures. Um, there are all resources online from New York State that, you know, um, provide the guidelines in terms of how to be safe and, you know, how to allow people back into the office, a lot of blogs and and cleaning and sanitary items. Um, but I think as long as you personally are comfortable, it's obviously fine. Um, I think the question maybe if I'm understanding it correctly is more um, geared towards in a situation where you are not comfortable meeting that person. And <clears throat> if you can defer to the policy of the company, if the company is not allowing that yet, that's obviously one option. Um, but the other option is honestly just um, pivoting from that, right? Is, is there a real need, understanding if there's a real need to meet in person in an office? Likely not. Um, you know, could the same, unless there's huge piles of paperwork that need to be addressed, that might be something different. But outside of that, there probably is not a reason you couldn't meet at an outdoor coffee shop or, you know, something to that effect. Um, I think people are pretty Generally speaking, I think people are pretty understanding of the situation and I would be surprised if somebody really insists, but that, that's the best advice, honestly, I could give. Yeah, adhering to the safety standards that we've all been you know, hearing a lot about. And uh, Russell, there's a question for you, but I, I see you raise your hand here too. Well, I would say that we've actually lost a few new, new potential clients because we will not meet in the office. Um, we'll meet people out, outdoors, um, but if somebody insists on an office meeting, I'm not gonna make anyone on my team go to the office. And if somebody insists on that, maybe they're not the right client for us. I mean, we're very hardworking, we're very dedicated. Um, we'll take calls all time of day and night, but if somebody insists on person meeting, it's just not what's the risk. You know, we mentioned before about values in an organization, that's really living your values, right? And putting, you know, really walking the talk. Um, Russell, there's a question, thank you for the answer. There's a question. Russell, for the monthly check-ins, do you do it with everyone? Um, let's see, do you do it with everyone or people that just ask for it? So every, short answer is everybody. Um, most people want the monthly check-in. There's a few um, staff who don't necessarily want the monthly check-in, but I think that's still important to have a monthly check-in with everybody. 
Okay, that's good. All right, so with all of that, I want to move on to um, our third question, and that is, what are the ways um, that you've made your employees feel valued and appreciated? I know you might have brought some of these uh, answers up before, but I wanted to address it from that standpoint. And then were there communication processes? And I think, again, you spoke a little bit about it, so maybe we'll elaborate a little bit more. You know, was there a different communication process you put in place? And um, if you had a tip for, you know, keeping morale high, what, was, what would be something that you could, you know, share with us? So any of those points of the question that you want to answer, Christina? Sure. So I think it's super important to have a personalized approach for each team member because everybody on the team, especially during these chaotic times, have completely different needs. Some people might, you know, for instance, I have three kids uh, that are at home doing homeschooling sometimes, which is chaotic in my own life. Um, some employees, every employee has different needs. Some people might have um, a, a sick or elderly family member that they need to stay on top of um, and they need to be available at certain times. So I think it's just really important to have a personalized approach and see what everyone's specific needs are during this, you know, hectic and chaotic time. And to do that, I do one-on-one um, -on -one monthly Zoom meetings with each employee. So it's a nice way to just check in, see how they're doing. It's so important to be on video because if you're just doing it over the phone, you obviously can't read their body language <laughs> and really like dig deeper and see if there's something that's going on with that employee. Um, so listening is key. And then as far as tips for keeping up employee morale and keeping things fun, you know, we've been doing some fun contests. So we want to keep that company culture going, even though we're not in the office anymore. So we're doing fun things like name that buzzer. <laughs> and we're doing like a baby picture and fun facts with prizes. And sometimes we'll tie it into our business and I'll do a find the typo contest that whoever finds the typo gets a Starbucks or an Amazon gift card. So it's fun things that you can still do on Zoom, but it keeps the team um, engaged, a little lighter. We're also doing like a team strength and personality test. Um, and that's really cool because it kind of shows you whose strengths vary on the team. And again, it's something that helps when you're virtual. Um, some of our clients have done virtual cooking classes, virtual happy hours. We're also doing lunch and learns to share best practices. So even though everybody might be scattered, there's still lots of things that you can do to bring the team together. Thank you for sharing those. Did anybody else, did we miss any of the topics or any of the <clears throat> any answer to those questions that uh, we might not have gotten some feedback on? Russell? I'm gonna add a few of the things that we've thought of. Um, <coughs> but the, I think the, um, the lawyers on my team are all motivated. They appreciate that we haven't reduced salaries, which a lot of law firms have done. That the staff, I think is harder to keep motivated um, certainly the hourly employees. I find that, you know, a small Amazon gift card every now and then to say, hey, great job done. That can really boost morale. Um, we've done um, some game show time things via Zoom. Um, and we invite kids and spouses to join. We're going to do a Yankwood LP trivia night. And then my idea that I thought of uh, last night was I'm going to, I'm not sure how we're going to do this yet, but we're going to try to send uh, your favorite alcoholic beverage on uh, November 3rd. I figured on what other side of the aisle are, you could probably use a drink that night. So we're going to try to do something like that. Very, very helpful, Tim. Very helpful, Tim. I think very that's creative. Uh, <laughs> I think we could probably all agree with that, with that one. <laughs> Anything else? Let's see. Do we have a, no, I, any other questions? Feel free. Oops, we do have one in that. I'm going to go ahead and address it here. Let's see. Do you find that you can be more productive by working in one specific room in your home or do you find yourself working past the normal hours? So two different questions. Um, productive being in one space and then two, are you finding you're not having boundary that you're <laughs> working all, all the time? So can anybody who would like, Carmen, would you like to address that first? Sure. Um, I have definitely round robin done a little bit of everything. Um, and I, for me personally, I do find one set space is best. I don't particularly have everything for us is in the cloud. I don't particularly have paperwork or files that I need in front of me. Um, everything can be downloaded from, um, from the cloud. So technically I can work from any space, but I think there's a, there's a mental piece to working from home. So um, one thing that I actually started doing, and I, I don't know if everybody does it, but I get dressed every morning as if I'm going to work and then I go 
down into the basement and go to work. Um, and I think it just puts me in the right mental space. Um, but in these days we have, we all have zoom meetings daily and, and things like that. So everyone has to be wearing their upperwear. But I do think that if they are also not wearing their pajama pants, it, it just puts you in the right, right frame of mind to, to tackle the day. So that's, that's been helpful. And the consistency, I think, helps literally seeing the same desk that you're sitting at, seeing the same, you know, walls in front of you, wherever you choose to, wherever you choose to park yourself. So I'm hearing you say, keep the routines, keep the patterns going and act like you are working because you are working. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, Chris, thank you, Carmen. Christina? I agree with Carmen 100%. I think it's so important to like have some kind of a physical and mental transition so that you know, you do have a little bit of that work life <laughs> separation going uh, when you're working from home. So same thing. I get up, I get dressed, I go down to the office downstairs. Um, and I think just being in that room and then leaving when you're done helps kind of like give you that little bit of closure. And then also changing into those comfy, you know, loungy, casual clothes mentally, you know, kind of signals. All right. You know, I mean, that doesn't mean that I don't log back on later and do some more work, but it's still a helpful process to kind of end the work day. And Russell? One thing that I've been doing um, with not 100% not success, but I try at night to delay all my emails till 9 a.m. in the morning. So last night, for example, I worked uh, after those town halls for about an hour and a half, but I delayed all the emails to this morning so while people don't love at 9 a.m., bing, ding, ding, you know, they'll get 20 emails from me. I think they appreciate not getting the emails late at night, then not knowing whether or not to respond or not. And it helps create a little more of a work-life balance for the team. So very helpful. Now we have another question. I think I'm gonna put this towards the end if somebody will remind me at the end when we come to this. It's using our crystal ball that we see a return of everyone back at the work office um, past COVID. We're at the end, if, we're gonna hang on to that to the end because we have some research and I wanna hear what, you know, what you're gonna do moving on. So we talked at the beginning about pre-COVID and now, and then at the end, I wanna wrap up with actually that question. So we'll move over to that in a little while. Um, so one of the questions too I saw before in the question box was, has working remotely changed your routine business practices? But I think all of you pretty much addressed that that was asked a little earlier um, on that one. And so moving on to a different subject or a different um, view, we've talked a lot about best practices. You know, you've been very helpful in sharing your tips and what you've done and the changes and making your employees feel value. But there are challenges. We have to be real about this. We talked about it at the beginning. This is unprecedented times. These are very, very difficult times um, for a lot of reasons. And so now we wanted to chat, change, I guess, the um, perspective to what are some of the challenges that you're facing while trying to keep your productivity up? Um, what, you know, in keeping your employees motivated, some of them are feeling burnt out. What, you know, what are these challenges that you've had to face and the second part of that is, um, you can answer either one or both, is what have you learned as, as a leader for yourself that's making you a better, um, better at your team, with your teams and in your organization? So who would like to start off on that one? Kathy, I can, I can jump in with the, the first part. Um, you know, I, I think that in terms of a challenge, um, and to Russell's point, we hired, we did have a new staff member that started, uh, you know, beginning of April. Um, and I think that uh, it's been a challenge to, you know, kind of integrate this person into the culture that we've worked really hard to develop over the last, you know, seven, seven to 10 years. And so I think that, um, that is, that's, that's a challenge. And, and, and I don't know any way around that, except, you know, I actually, you know, frankly, you know, just called her yesterday. She's working on a big project. And I was just like, Hey, you know, we, we, we see you, we, we recognize that you're working really hard. We know that this is, these are unusual times and, you know, we've got your back. And like that, that was the extent of the message. Um, but I think just trying to, you know, to Christina's point, really personalize that outreach and make people see, feel seen and heard is really important. And, um, you know, I, if I'm being really honest, I, I'm still trying to figure, figure this whole, you know, being a new leader as well as being a new leader in the time of a global pandemic. Um, but I'm really grateful that I've got a really great team, uh, a great board, 
uh, and um, who's supporting me along the way. Um, but it's it, it's a challenge, and it, it's a challenge, you know, again, personally, you know, trying to to frame that work life balance. I I I you know I don't think I'm actually doing it that great, but I, I'm aware of that, and so that's <laughs> the first step in trying to um, to make improvements. I think. Yeah, perfection doesn't exist, so we just have to integrate it and, and figure it out from there. So thank you for your honesty. Um, we have a question too, uh, just before um, I'm following up from before, so I'm just going to interject this. Um, following up on what Russell said, the question said, did you find if you respond to clients emails after hours, you're changing expectations about your availability to respond to them? Just want to just interject there before we, as we go on, Russell, can you answer that one for us? And then we'll continue. <laughs> with sure. That's a little tricky because it's coming from a client of mine, but I'll be honest with him. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Um, I sometimes with clients do have to manage expectations. Um, if you start responding to clients' emails at 10, 30 at night, you can then get into a long exchange until one o'clock in the morning. So um, to this client, sometimes I do see your emails late at night, I admit. And sometimes <laughs> I respond in the morning because I need my judgment. If I think it's urgent, I'll stop whatever I'm doing and deal with the client's emergency. If it's, you know, what document should I produce, you know, tomorrow morning, like that doesn't, that's not going to change anything, the pattern. If somebody thinks that, hey, am I going to lose my house? Um, should we, do we need to go to court tomorrow morning? Those I respond to in real time. But the other stuff, you have to set boundaries. And so I delayed those client emails as well. So we've said we wanted engaging and interactive and interesting. So I think we're getting that. <laughs> definitely just getting that. Money, all right. So I have another question here too. I think it ties into with our current one. What are some of the challenges and what have you learned uh, to, man to manage better during this crisis? The question is for those starting a new job during this time period, any suggestions for <clears throat> how to transition and integrate when everyone is virtual? So I think a definite challenge. I mean, Jeanette, I'm going to ask you to take that one on because I know you spoke into it a little bit, but I think you'd definitely be able to help uh, our audience member on that one. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it just really builds on what we've been talking about, about connection and routine. And, you know, at Volunteer New York, we also have a, an all staff meeting um, every other week. And for me, those be have become really valuable to as a connection point. And so we have at the start of each meeting, um, R before T, so relationship before tasks. And so we're always just kind of spending a little bit of time doing that pulse check and it helps to kind of name it. Um, and then um, also to, um, I think it was, it was Christina who talked about teams. So part of the technology investment that we made was the addition of teams as a tool for, for us. And, um, and, you know, I, I will often just, you know, send, send a quick, Hey, how you doing? Hey, Ping. you know, just as a way to kind of connect and, um, uh, you know, build that, that those relationships. Um, it, it's hard, you know, I, I think that uh, we're all doing a really great job of, of it virtually. Um, and, and it's hard. I, I think I had a little bit of a, of a leg up, if you will, in that I knew pretty much everyone at the office before I, you know, I, I came back. So that level, you know, I kind of knew where the light switches are. I, I knew, you know, the team. So that part, um, I didn't have to build those connections. So thank you for Kathy, sharing. We have. And I, Kathy, yeah, I, I just wanted get, to. Oh, go ahead. I, I just, just wanted, wanted to add something. We had to a, that. Yeah, I just wanted, one of the participants just asked a quick question. I'm sorry, Christine. Excuse me. So related to job tips for interviewing for Zoom, I think we'll say that to the end. If we have some, that's sort of a generic question. If we have some extra time, I just wanted to um, let the person know that I'm not. We, you know, we see their question. We'll get to it hopefully at the end. Go ahead, Christine. I apologize. Oh, no problem. Um, so just to further build upon what Jeanette was saying about integrating a new employee, you know, as I mentioned, we had a new employee start last week. She did not know anybody, so she was coming in brand new. Um, so I think it, again, is really important to do some of those things that um, Russell and I were talking about before, some of those fun team building type of events. Like, you know, that's why we're doing even like the uh, name that buzzer and having a fun fact that they're going to have to figure out who it is. Because just getting a little bit personal and getting them to know the team helps them feel more comfortable coming in. Because again, coming in virtually as a new employee can be certainly challenging if you don't know everyone. 
And then for the challenges, Kathy, when you ask that question, I just want you to underscore, and this will be no surprise as the PR person, but just how important it is to communicate. You know, again, it's always better to over communicate than under communicate. Sometimes we as leaders assume that everybody on the team has the same knowledge that's in our head. <laughs> we have to make sure that we're constantly, you know, transferring that knowledge into our team's minds and, um, you know, communicating to them what the priorities are, what you're expecting from them, um, and just making sure that they're not feeling overwhelmed. So always over communicate rather than under. Yeah, I think that's a very valuable point. And um, there's lots of things like giving feedback and all of those kinds of things too, that, you know, managing expectations, holding people accountable in these times are really hard, right? You don't want to micromanage. So there's lots of challenges. And um, so I'm wondering, Carmen, um, the, about the leadership one. Well, how is managing this crisis? Because for a while, real estate wasn't allowed to be in homes. You were really, you know, weren't an essential employee. I you in, in this crisis, you know, in your business about leading and uh, is it different for you or do you have some takeaways for us? Sure. Um, in those months where we were non-essential, I mean, everyone was looking for a house deemed us essential, but the rest of the, <laughs> the rest of the state did not. Um, but um, it, it was, it was something that was totally unexpected. I mean, I think the, you know, the state, the country, the world, you know, did not expect this. Um, but from an, from an industry, from a business perspective, I mean, it went from, you know, uh, a projection of boom, right? Because there was the spring market and that was supposed to be when, um, when money was going to start coming in or, you know, um, things of that nature. And it was the complete opposite, right? So there was a huge, so I spent all that time, honestly, on webinars with BCW and any other organization I could find to try and figure out how to just keep ourselves afloat, right? I knew loans were going to be necessary. I just knew that all of those things had to happen. Um, so I had to learn a, a different skill set. I got very well versed in Zoom, so that was great. Um, and I did look for other alternatives, such as Office 365 has been great. Um, Microsoft Teams has been great. I knew there was going to be a new transition, um, so I had to adapt. Um, now things are, are changing uh, to the opposite extreme, which is like, you know, we can't have any moment to rest really because there has been such a backlog from March to June um, that has now sort of um, funneled into a small space before winter truly hits and everybody is trying to get out of the city as well. Um, I don't even know if I'm answering your question. Um, well, so. I think, yeah, I, and to your point, I think it's the resiliency, the ability to adapt and to always to just understand that while you might have known the world before, you know, and, and the way you led your team, you've had to learn a whole new way. And, and the fact that we have to stay relevant, you've done whatever it took to, to do that. So no, you answered it really well. Um, thank you so much. All right, and we have last two questions and we're, believe it or not, this has gone so fast and, and we're getting <laughs> towards the end, but I have the last two questions. I wanna make sure we get to them as well as um, just comment that somebody else here said that they agree with over communicating is far better than under communicating, Christina. So lots of um, people resonated with that one. <laughs> All right, so um, a little different note again, we're gonna shift again to silver lining. So, have there been any silver linings? I just wanted to know if a couple of you could just throw out some things that, look, there's always good things um, that come with the bad, even if we don't see them at the moment. So what have been some of the silver linings that um, you're, you've either experienced personally or professionally? So um, Carmen, I'm gonna pick up, yeah. uh, that, that's okay, now I'll come back to you, Christina. Yeah. Go ahead, Carmen, yeah. I'm gonna tap Yeah, I, I have to say that I am probably the mo one of the most traditional um, workers or professionals. Um, I believe very much in um, the archaic, you know, FaceTime, you go into the office. If you're not in the office, you're not working. Even though I very well knew that if I was at home, I was absolutely working when I was, you know, not a business owner. Um, but that was just a, a mindset that I think was instilled in me um, in like corporate, big corporate culture. Um, so this has forced me to not do that. And even in, um, as the businesses were reopening and offices were able to have employees come back, you know, I definitely surveyed the, are you willing, will you come in, you know, because in my mind, you're not working if you're not in the office. Um, and then I just, I had to honestly make myself take a step back and say, you know what, let's just 
let's just do this. Everyone's uncomfortable. Let's take a step back. Let's see how things are going. This ties into one of the earlier questions, which is how do you know your employees are working, you know, when they're not in the office, right? So, you know, there's the timekeeping function of clocking in and clocking out, but then there's the productivity factor. And that's actually what I started to do was just focus on, you know, what have you asked them to do this week and did they do it? And at the end of the day, I think that is the most relevant piece of information. Um, and that now, now in October, that has allowed me to uh, see the value of allowing employees that flexibility. And one of our staff is actually going to be moving. Um, and I never would have dreamed of keeping, moving to uh, South Carolina. So I never would have dreamed of keeping her on the team while living in South Carolina. But at this point, 100%. I mean, and I give her a raise. Like, there's no way that, you know, I'm going to let her go because everyone's been going above and beyond, I think, uh, to adjust to this new normal. I think those who are still employed are very fortunate and are grateful and are acting and are acting that way. So thank you. Just going around it. the last, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, just one sentence about, you know, Christina, just, you know, and then um, Jeanette and, and Russell, just one sentence about a silver lining. What's one, one silver lining thing you might throw out? Yeah. I mean, I think uh, less commuting time uh, has enabled a little bit more personal time. I go on a morning walk now with my husband um, instead of that 45 minutes driving to the office. So getting some nice exercise, which is good physically and mentally. Um, and just having, you know, you see your family. I, I've been hearing this from clients and, you know, people I've been talking to, you just see your family a little bit more, um, which I think is usually a good thing. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. Okay, and um, that's our, getting near our timer here, sorry. Um, and Jeanette, do you have one, uh, one tip or one thing you want to share with that? Yeah, I think for me, it's, uh, it really pushed uh, our team to um, lean into to technology. So we had some folks who, you know, maybe have been a little, a little hesitant, but, you know, you, you have to innovate and be creative. And so it really kind of pushed us to, to get there. And then the only thing I would say is, um, you know, in addition to staff, we have a new board of directors, a new class, I call them, that kind of joins every year. And for me, a silver lining is I, I have this kind of unique connection with these folks about have, having kind of started, if you will, our, our term at the same time. And so I think it does create opportunities to have these kind of common experiences that you can, um, you know, kind of connect about uh, in, into the future. So that's what I would great. say. That's yeah, a great point. And Russell, do you have one um, comment you want to make there for us about the silver lining? Sure. Silver lining is that uh, I am horrible at firing people. But with the uh, pandemic, you can see who really rises to the top. And 90% of the office really rose to the occasion and are true professionals. And the, the two employees that did not, you know, we let go. And I would have kept them for another five years. So it's harsh to say, but 90% <laughs> of the team that really rose to the occasion and doing what they need to do to keep them from going, it's, it's very appreciated. And you can see that these are true professionals. So that's an interesting point because some research again tells us, and it's good news for you leaders, is that 78% of employees agree or somewhat agree on the survey that we, that we researched, um, that they feel confident about the COVID. 19 challenges. So kudos to all of you. Okay, so we got this question asked la uh, earlier, and this is our last question, our final one. Remote work is here to stay. We all have to agree to that. Probably somewhat we agree. At least <laughs> It's quickly changed the way business is done. Employers have had to respond, offering a flexible work schedule. Carmen mentioned that her one of her employees would be moving, and she would have never allowed that before. And also, you know, even helping set up a, a home office. Some people didn't know how to do that or don't know how to manage that. Um, and because of this, productivity actually has remained pretty stable. So to all of you, and just again, one, because we're getting close to the time, just one sentence about remote is permanent or what are your plans? Um, let's see, we'll st start with you, Russell, again. We will go back to the office um, probably beginning of second quarter next year, when there hopefully is a vaccine that works, but maintain the flexibility that people want to go to their kids' soccer game or dance recital. They'll go to the 
kids events, and then they'll go back to the home office or the work office. But we will go back to the office. Okay. And I have some statistics that someone asked a little bit before that. Thank you. Um, and Jeanette. Yeah, I, I, I think I anticipate that we will go back to the office, uh, you know, say early next year. Um, however, you know, we're having really conversations, you know, we're a nonprofit, our rent is our second largest expense. Um, and so for us, it is actually a larger kind of strategic question of long term, do we really need this space? Interesting. I've heard that a lot. A lot of people spoke to that. And Carmen, for you, what, you know, remote or, well, you're, you're a little bit of a different business. You have to see people. <laughs> right. Um, so to piggyback off Jeanette, same with the rent expense. Um, we actually have committed, our lease actually happened to come to a five-year end at the end of this year, and we will be reducing the office space. And I'm going to use that money towards more team building events. Um, the money will still get spent, just not for an empty office for people to come into. Uh, for us, remote will be permanent. Um, it's been proven to me that that the in-person uh, the in-person activity is not necessarily a requirement for productivity and efficiency. And thank you. And Christina, finally. Yep. So um, we will be returning to the office. Um, I do like the collaboration of having the team all together, but we have always been and will always continue to have um, tons of flexibility for our employees. Very, very good. Thank you, all of us. And we are totally, I keep saying it, but we are really getting close to right. So I'm going to give you each just like 30 seconds to give us one takeaway. I don't think I have any other questions. Um, oh, wait, I have one quick answer here. Somebody wanted to know some statistics about going back to work. 26% of the people um, think that Q1, Q2 will be when they come back. 5% maybe not until Q3, 4, and 4% 4 will never return. 4% always work remotely. Um, John, we might be out of time for the one last comment. Are we out of time for that? It, uh, we're, if you can get 30 second answers from the panelists, if you want to get it in, go ahead. Okay, well, you know what? Are we good with it? I just had maybe one a couple takeaways I just wanted to right. share with everybody. So is that okay? I'll just give some of the general. So foster human connection, a couple of the takeaways I've heard today, which have been really valuable, be flexible and, and adaptable. Resilience will prevail. Um, mm -hmm. Address concerns, stress, challenges, wellness, you know, communicate, communicate, as we've all said, and embrace new opportunities, recognize the challenges. Do have a silver lining, even if we can't see them quite yet. We're all in it together and it's the only way out of it is by, you know, by being in it together and things will get better. And thank you again to all of you. You've done a fabulous job and John and business council and, um, and everybody from Mayo Peck bank for sponsoring this event. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, John. Thank you. Kathy. Thank you. Fantastic job to our panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, I think all of us learned some tips uh, and some lessons, best practices that uh, we can implement. Uh, for full disclosure, for the Business Council of Westchester, we did go start going back into the office this summer, three days a week, which has continued uh, through and will continue through the end of the calendar year. We're in the office Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and then working remotely Thursday and Friday, and we're learning as we go. Uh, but our director of operations, Yvette Molina, really spent a lot of hours putting together our reemergence plan, and that's on our Business Resource Center page, so we always encourage businesses to look at that about the good checklist that you should be already thinking about. Um, this program, which again, had so many good, important best practices, next week will be on our business resource page. So for folks who wanna go back to it and listen to it or wanna share it with other people, please do so. Uh, we also have a few events, uh, more events coming up uh, in the next few weeks that I think uh, everyone should uh, pay attention uh, to your Monday memos. So it might be something that you and your team will want to be involved in next week. And also on October 20th, we have our Circles of Influence, which is a great opportunity for BCW members and prospect members to get together. That will be at 4.30. Uh, we'll also be doing a second Circle of Influence on October 27th, also at 4.30. Uh, next Friday, on October 23rd, every four years, we do a program called The Road to the White House. Uh, which is usually held the week before the election and has been commented today, I think, uh, has been a draining process uh, watching this election. Uh, but we want to bring together uh, state political leaders uh, as well as a national pollster uh, to talk about uh, the key, uh, obviously the presidential race, but also key races throughout the country and in New York State. 
So that will be uh, next Friday at 9 a.m. Uh, again, these are all on your Monday memo to register on our event page. Uh, on, uh, we're very excited that on October 29th, uh, we will be doing our Westchester Business Expo virtual trade show. This is a first for us, uh, but we're very excited about that. And that will be from one to five on October 29th. Uh, to learn more about the expo, please go to our website. And then on uh, November 12th at 4.30, we will have our evening networking reception. Uh, and then finally, uh, the last event I want to touch on is our annual dinner, which is on November 19th at 6 p.m. The title of our annual dinner is Resilience and Reflection. And uh, we, I think, are putting together a very exciting uh, program uh, uh, to really, ref again, touch on the real leadership that the Westchester business community has given, uh, not just to our county, but to our state and to our country and the way they've handled this pandemic, both public and private sector, uh, as well as our hospital systems that were on the front line. So we encourage everyone to go to that. Again, to Dave D'Amelia and his team at Tompkins Mayapack Bank, thank you for your partnership. Thank you for your support. Again, to Kathy D'Agostino and our panelists, thank you very much. Uh, and Again, the annual dinner is on November 9th. Uh, so I wanna make sure everybody has that date down, November 9th at 6 p.m. Uh, for all of you here on behalf of Marsha Gordon, our president and CEO and the entire BCW team, uh, to your employees, to your family, stay healthy, still stay safe, wear the mask, and uh, have a great weekend. <laughs> Thanks, Thank John. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kathy. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. Bye-bye, John.